Good evening. Let's start this evening with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful, again, uh, to be able to be in your house. We're thankful for the break and weather. And uh, Lord, the, uh, with the beauty of the snow, it is nice to uh, have the dry pavement outside as well and the sunshine. Uh, we know there are others in our country even that are experiencing more severe weather, and we do pray for their needs and pray for those that have lost power or looking at huge snowpack and the rain, and, and uh, Lord, pray that you'd meet their needs. In the meantime, we are grateful for the, the uh, blessing of the mild weather we've been having and pray that you would continue to meet our needs and, and bless us. We pray as we meet together tonight that we'd honor and glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 527 tonight, I think. Ooh. These slides for those following it along at home may be cutting off the top of some of the letters. Only the first one. No. Oh, I guess I can fix that then. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to His name, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to His name. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin, I am so glad I have entered in, there Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to His name, glory to His name, glory to His name, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to His name, come to this fountain so rich and sweet, Cast your poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood of Christ. All right, and for those following along, we are in Galatians chapter 2 tonight. Galatians chapter 2, and remember the book of Galatians, Paul is defending the gospel against those that would want to Judaize it, that would want to make it uh, a gospel that required the conversion to Judaism or the following of the Jewish laws. And uh, it's still amazing that even with a book like Galatians, that people try to do that today, to add the Jewish faith to the gospel. And certainly the gospel came out of the Jewish faith, uh, but it came out of. And uh, we're going to see Paul uh, in Galatians chapter 2 explains the unchanging gospel to all people. That's the amazing thing about the gospel is it is the same gospel to everyone. And as we watch it, we, we uh, find out that the gospel doesn't change 
for us. It doesn't, it's not concerned with what we feel about it. It doesn't care what would make us feel better. The gospel doesn't change for us. It changes us and it sets us free. Most people feel a little bit nervous about receiving a gift. Uh, gifts are fine, but sometimes we find that a gift places a feeling of obligation on the receiver to reciprocate in some way. Uh, I remember on a TV show years ago, someone was nervous about getting a gift because of the, the social uh, demands of receiving a gift. That if someone gives you a gift, society kind of requires you to give them a gift back. Now that's the wrong way to think of it. But this character was thinking about it that way. The only problem was they didn't know what sort of gift they were getting. And they wanted to respond in kind because they didn't want to give too big of a gift and make the other person feel bad. And they didn't want to give too small of a gift and feel bad themselves. So they hatched an elaborate plan to uh, buy gifts of many different sizes so they'd be prepared for whatever gift came their way. Uh, sometimes when people receive the gospel, they feel like something must be given back in return. And even as we look at uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, uh, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We go, yes, the gospel is free. It's not based on what we do so that man doesn't have a way to boast. And then we get to verse 10. For we are God's workmanship in Christ Jesus. Uh-oh. No. Ephesians 2.10. For I grace you are saved through faith, and it's not of yourselves as a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I know Ephesians gets a little bit over. It was there in my mind. For we are his workmanship. I was right. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Like, aha, see, God wants us to walk in good works. Yes. Are those good works part of the gospel? The gospel is good news of salvation. Are those good works required to accept the gospel? And the answer is no. In someone that has received the gospel, those good works are a response to the gospel, and they are the proper response to the gospel. But they are not required. The gospel has all been paid for. Jesus said, it is finished. He didn't say the down payment has been made. He said it's finished. So the gospel doesn't change for us. It changes us and it sets us free. Now the gospel is the same for all people. Galatians chapter 2 verse 1, Paul as he is explaining, I was sent to preach the gospel and then, verse 1, 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem, with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went by up by revelation and I communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus who was with me being a Greek was compelled to be circumcised. The gospel is the same for all people. Paul says after 14 years, 14 years after first going to Jerusalem, he went back up to Jerusalem and he shared with them the gospel he had been preaching. He says, if you don't think my gospel is a real gospel, let me tell you, I went back to Jerusalem 14 years after my first trip to Jerusalem and, and I hadn't met with many of the, any of the apostles there, save James, the Lord's brother, uh, and Peter. So that's, and I was there 15 days. Now, 14 years later, I went back and I told them the gospel I was preaching. And guess what? It was the same gospel that the apostles in Jerusalem had been preaching. And he says, I, I shared that gospel with the Jews. And the Jews at the time, 14 years after Paul had been preaching, did not require, verse 3, Titus to be circumcised. He says, I went to Jerusalem and shared with them the gospel I was preaching to the Gentiles. And I went and communed with them. And I had Titus with me. And Titus was a Greek. And no one at any time said, you know what? 
Titus really needs to be circumcised to follow the law of the Jews. They accepted the gospel I preached and didn't make any changes to it. It was the same gospel that they were preaching in Jerusalem that Paul was preaching to the Gentiles. Now, that didn't mean everyone was happy with it. Verse 4, uh, And that, because of false brethren unawares, brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. He said, there were some that wanted to find out what we were doing, and they heard of our liberty. Our liberty? Yes, they weren't following the Jewish law. And they heard about that, and they wanted to bring, it, bring them into bondage to that law. Verse 5, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. <laughs> we didn't give them place to spread their lies, that the truth of the gospel might continue with these. But of these it seems to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. So despite the complaints of some, nothing changed with my gospel. They didn't add anything to it. They didn't say, oh, Paul, you've been preaching this gospel, but you forgot people shouldn't eat pork. But you forgot the males ought to be circumcised. But you forgot they ought to be worshiping God on Saturday because that's our Sabbath. But you forgot, you forgot, you forgot. They didn't, he said, they didn't add anything to the gospel. I presented what I was sharing and they didn't add anything. The Jews understood that the gospel is for all. Verse 7, he says, but contrary wise, <laughs> they didn't add anything. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the gospel, apostleship of circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. He says, despite the complaints of some, they saw the gospel was the same. And as Peter was called to the Jews, I was called to the Gentiles and were preaching the same gospel. And they were excited by that. And they saw that the same God was at work. Nothing was added to Paul's gospel by the Jews. Back in 6, nothing added. Verse 9, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, <laughs> perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I was also forward to do. He said, they made one suggestion to us when we shared the gospel that we were preaching with them. They said, whoa, whoa, just make sure you take care of the poor, that we should remember the poor. And Paul's like, uh, duh, yeah, that's what we're doing. He said, the only suggestion they made to us was take care of the poor, which we were forward, which I also was forward to do. Just the only change they made was something we were already doing, caring for the poor in the midst there. Nothing was added to Paul's gospel by the Jews. So here in Galatians, where some are seeking to add in Judaism into the gospel, Paul says, well, this is a first. I went to the Jews. I explained to them the gospel I was sharing with the Gentiles, and no one at any time mentioned circumcision. I even talked with James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars they seemed to be the go-to guys that knew what was going on in the church, and, and uh, they didn't add anything onto it. The gospel's the same for all people. The problem is sometimes we want to change the message to make it more appealing. Sometimes we want to change the message to make it more appealing to us. Sometimes, the Galat as the uh, Galatians were hearing from those that wanted to make it a Jewish gospel, they wanted to make it more appealing to the Jews, and they wanted everyone else to follow the Jewish rules that they were set on following themselves. They said, if we're going to follow these rules, we want other people to do it too. We can't change the message to make it more appealing. Now, if someone decides they want to try to keep the law of Israel, the law of Moses, should we tell them, no, well, that's, that's bad. Is the law bad? No, the law is not bad. 
if someone decides they want to follow the law of Moses? Is that bad? No. If someone says, I'm saved if I follow the law of Moses, we've got a problem. Salvation is by grace through faith. If someone decides they want to uh, abstain from pork, more for the rest of us, that should lower the price, supply and demand, right? If someone decides that, that well, I, I really want to uh, keep the Sabbath, and uh, so I'm going to get one of those Sabbath stoves that keeps a pilot light lit so I don't have to kindle a fire on the Sabbath. I'm going to take it to, to the extreme, and I'm going to try to follow it. So, well, why? Well, I don't know. I suppose there could be a good reason for it, as long as that reason isn't because it makes me more holy because it makes God accept me. The law was given to the Jews to show them that they couldn't meet God's holy standard. And if we ever try to follow it so that we feel like we're keeping God's standard, we're doing it wrong. We can't change the message to make it more appealing. So what if it's not the Jewish law that we're seeking to follow, but it's other men's rules that we want to add on to it? Same story. Standards are okay things for us to have for ourselves. I want to meet this standard. I think it would be good for me and my spiritual growth to meet this standard. Perfectly fine. I'm going to keep this standard because I think God's going to like me more. Wrong answer. I'm going to keep this standard because I think it helps me pay for my salvation. Wrong answer. And the interesting thing here is Paul, in sharing the, the problem that was going on in the Galatian church, gets to share with them that Peter had some of the same problem in his day. Verse 11, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to, to the face because he was to be blamed. See, Peter had tried to change the gospel to make it more appealing. So wait, Peter, the, the rock that Jesus was going to build his church on? No. Peter, the apostle, the disciple that after the resurrection of Christ became one of the apostles and was a leader in the church, made a mistake. That happens with just about every Bible character we see. They're all flawed, uh, other than Jesus. But Paul withstood him to his face. Why? Because verse 12, For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. James was, or Peter was eating with the Gentiles, but when uh, those came from James, the Jewish people came, he withdrew and wouldn't eat with the Gentiles because he was afraid of what they would think. You see, he, he, he picked up on, aha, the gospel to the Gentiles means they're okay. They're accepted by grace through faith. They're holy in the church. They're holy in the body of Christ without following the Jewish dietary laws. So he would eat with them. It doesn't tell us if he ate all things with them, but a, a, a strict Jew would be very hard-pressed to eat in one of our homes because they would want to make sure that everything was prepared in a kosher way. So if Peter was eating with them, chances are he wasn't following the Jewish dietary guidelines and the Jewish laws for food preparation. Is that bad? Well, no, because the Jewish dietary laws doesn't save Peter. But then when the Jewish people came, he stopped eating with the Gentiles because he didn't want the Jewish people to condemn him or judge him. Peter decided he would eat with the Gentiles, but he wasn't convinced that that was okay. Or he was convinced it was okay, but he didn't want to stand for truth. He wanted to fold to the Jewish people that wanted the, to add their laws to it. He did one thing around one group and another thing around another. And the reason he did it was because he feared man. He feared what others would say. Verse 13, And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Because 
There were other Jews that did the same thing. They, they pandered to the Gentiles and said, yes, we're free in Christ. You can eat as you want. But as soon as the Jews came around, like, uh, uh, we didn't hang out with them. Well, what were they doing? They were saying one thing, but acting another way. Verse 14, Paul says, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? See, the problem wasn't that Gentiles acted like Gentiles, or that Jews acted like Jews. The problem was Jews were acting like Gentiles, and then telling the Gentiles they needed to follow the Jewish law. Hmm. We can't change the message to make it more appealing. And Paul recognized he needed to stand for truth, even though that meant standing up to Peter, even though that meant standing up to others that had more time in the church than he did. Salvation and life are lived by faith. That's the unchanging truth of the gospel. It's by faith. We're saved by grace through faith. Verse 15, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. How do the Jewish people know that they are not justified by the works of the law? Because they have to keep offering sacrifices. If they were justified by the works of the law, they'd be, they'd be set, they'd be good, but they kept doing it. And they knew that they couldn't keep the law. We're not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found, also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the thing which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Build again the thing he destroyed? Well, what did Paul destroy? Did Paul say he's destroying the, the law of God? Well, no, but by accepting salvation by faith, he said that the law, the works of the law, can't save me. He says, why would we build that system back up inside the church? If that can't save us and we're already saved by Christ, why are we going to build that back up? It's, it, we've already proved that it can't save us. And all we're going to do is make ourselves a transgressor again. If we say you have to follow the law to be a Christian, we've just undone the grace of God and we've moved ourselves from being saved by faith in Jesus Christ to again not being saved by the works of the law that we're trying to follow. Changing the gospel breaks the gospel. That's the number one reason why we should not try to change the gospel. There are certain things when you try to change them don't work out so well. I've seen people change things and get wonderful things in response and in, in, in after what they've done. Uh, I've seen tool creations that people have made by welding things and making things. And, and I've seen other things where people have destroyed things by trying to make them into something else, by trying to fix something. The gospel is one of those things that can't be fixed by us. If we try to fix it, we break it. The reason for that is it's already perfect. If you change something that's perfect, it's going to be broken. You can't better something that is perfect. And so Paul says, if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Verse 19, for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Wait, through the law, he's dead to the law? How is he through the law dead to the law? Well, through the law, he learned that he could not justify himself before God. And then Christ came and died and fulfilled the law. The law did what it was supposed to do. It pointed people to Christ, and then Christ fulfilled the law. And through that, he says, I'm dead to the law. It no longer has any hold over me. I'm dead to it. I don't have to respond to it, that I might live unto God. And what we find out in these last couple of verses of Galatians chapter 2 is that life comes from being dead to self. Verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. 
Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. The, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Life comes from being dead to self. We live in a world where life comes from doing what you want to do. Life, the most, the, the most alive you can be is if you can do everything you want. Have it your way. <coughs> do what you want. But life comes through being dead to self. So how in the world does that happen? How does freedom come from following Christ? Doesn't Christ put restrictions on my life? Doesn't following God limit my available choices, the things that I might want to do? Well, absolutely. So does a driver's, driver's manual. It puts limits on what we can do. The driver's manual tells me that when I come up to an octagonal sign that's red and it's got four letters on it, I don't have to be able to even read those four letters. I know what they say. Stop. And they tell me that despite the fact that I might be in a hurry and I might want to just blow right through that, I'm supposed to come to a stop. Well, they can't tell me what to do. How is that better for me? Well, just imagine the chaos if no one followed any traffic signals, any signs, or anything. We have safety on the roads when the rules are followed. If the rules aren't followed, we have chaos on the roads. God's rules are better than man's rules. God's rules for our life are better than the driver's manual for the state of New York, or Pennsylvania, or Ohio, or California, probably a lot better than the California one. Because I hear they don't like have to come to a complete stop at the stop sign, right? They got the California roll thing going. And we have our greatest life by limiting our choices by what God has told us. On top of that, he says, I'm crucified with Christ. Well, what part of me is crucified? If Paul is saying, I am crucified with Christ, he's still alive. What part of him is crucified? He's crucified with Christ because he's dead to pride. He doesn't need that anymore. <laughs> the Paul that said, I was a Jew of Jews. I, I followed the law. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I had everything going my way, had everything to be proud in how he was keeping the law. He says, I'm dead to pride. I don't care what people think of me anymore. I don't care if people think I'm, I'm, I'm not holy, I'm not just. I'm living for Christ. He's dead to pride. He was dead to selfish desires. The things that he wanted to do, he says, some of those things don't benefit me, so I'm not going to do them. And he was dead to his self-serving ways. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul doesn't defend his gospel by saying, <coughs> look, I, I don't say Gentiles have to be circumcised, but I tell them they have to do this, and they have to do this, and they have to do this, and they have to do this. He says, I tell them they have to live by faith. Because he says, I'm not going to frustrate the grace of God. Now, frustrate, you know, we think of frustrating people. To frustrate the grace of God is to short circuit it, is to make it, as he says, vain. We frustrate it when we don't use it properly. He says, I don't frustrate the grace of God. I don't say that the grace of God doesn't work and we need the law to work. He goes, if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. He says, my life is in Christ, and I live by faith. It's not because of what I do. It's not because I'm writing these letters. It's not because of the number of times I've shared the gospel. I live by faith, and God lives through me, and I'm saved by faith. Now, we also know Paul was a huge advocate 
for getting rid of bad things in his life and in, in advocating for people to get rid of bad things in their life and replacing them with things that glorify God. Well, hold on. How can he say salvation is by faith and then tell us how we ought to live? How do the two of those things go together? Those two things go together because you can live by faith and live with standards in your life or you can live by standards and not have the faith there. Paul says, I've got standards. I'm not going to force them on anyone. I live by faith and I let God do the work, even as he advocates for what that is. The gospel doesn't change for us. It changes us and it sets us free. Dead to self, but alive unto God. The unchanging gospel, the same gospel to all people. And we don't want to add to it. We don't want to change it. Paul says even Peter tried to add to it, tried to change it, tried to adjust it. Uh, but we need to accept the gospel as it is. Well, we are going to go offline for our time of prayer tonight.